This is ThinkTech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha. My name is Roger Jelinek. I'm the host of Book World for ThinkTech Hawaii. And my guest today is Patricia Steinhoff, professor of sociology at the University of Hawaii, uh, who is the prime editor of, of a team of translators and editors of what was a terrific bestseller in Japan uh, a little while ago. It took some time to get it done. It's, it's called uh, Destiny, uh, the S Secret Operation of the Togodo, Togodo Exiles. And the original book was by Koji Takazawa. Um, Pat, uh, tell us first uh, how you got into Japanese studies as a sociologist, just and how you got to Japan. Yeah. OK, thank you for having me here. Yeah. Um, I grew up in the middle of Michigan and went to the University of Michigan, where I got entranced by the idea of Asian languages. And at that time, you could go to Japan, but you couldn't go to China. So I decided to study Japanese. I had an undergraduate major in Japanese. And then at the early in that time, I had a summer trip to Japan. And then when I finished, I spent another year of language study in Japan. Late in my undergraduate career, I realized I needed a discipline. Uh, I didn't want to just do language. And the discipline that seemed to fit best was sociology. I was interested in contemporary society, interpersonal relations, and that I could do in sociology. It was also pretty exciting. Yes, it was an exciting time. time. Yes, yeah. yes, it was. Yeah. Um, and so, and a lot of my classmates were becoming sociology majors. Um, at Michigan, I was involved in the Michigan Daily, which was the center of political activity. So I was around the edges of it, but was not directly involved. And then after um, Michigan, I went to Harvard uh, for a dissertation. I have no MA. I just went to Harvard. Um, and my at that time, there wasn't a sociology department at Harvard. You could get a degree. You could get a PhD in sociology. But it was given through the uh, social relations department, which was an interdisciplinary department. And I had already done the Japanese before I got there. I knew that's what I wanted to study. So it was just a question of how was I going to do it. And uh, um, I don't think many people really understand the Japanese political scene immediately after World War II. Uh, we think of it as the time of the occupation and MacArthur. Uh, so it's military yes. terms, uh, but in fact it was uh, a very lively political okay. scene. Uh, can you describe yes. that? Yes. Well, first of all, the occupation ended in 1952. Yeah. Okay. So then there were a few years where they were developing their own political systemation uh, system. They had been um, gifted by the occupation with a remarkably liberal and complete. Um, constitution and it was approved by their diet so they own it but it was largely written crafted by the occupation um, people in the post-war period looking backward and saying this is we don't want Japan to do what they did in the pre-war period so they need to be to have the tools for democracy well integrated and they got that and so they were developing they were going past the occupation and by 1960, there was um, a huge political upheaval over the renewal of the um, security treaty with the United States, by which American troops were stationed in Japan, as they had been. Paid for by Japan. Uh, largely paid for by yeah. Japan, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. But uh, the United States was pushing that very hard, and the very conservative Japanese government was, too. But the population was quite uneasy about it, particularly because the Japanese constitution has the famous Article 9, which says Japan, Japan forever renounces the right to, to conduct war. Mm -hmm. And so many people felt that the security treaty itself was a violation of the constitution. And others felt just that they didn't want to be that closely tied to the US. And as the Cold War was, ramp yes, ramping, the Cold War was, was yes. ramping up, what, what was the 
what was your sense as a sociologist of Japanese response to the Cold War? It was all over the place, yeah. okay? Yeah. On the one hand, there was a conservative government that was happy to be allied with the United States and opposed to the Soviet Union, but the war, the Constitution had legalized a whole range of political actors, including a legal Communist Party and a legal Socialist Party. Mm -hmm. And so there was a strong left in Japan, and they, of course, were not very sympathetic to the United States and had different views. So the population had a full array of possibilities. Um, and the students had been, uh, post-war students had been uh, organized in part through the Communist Party. So there was a quite strong left influence in the universities, despite the early period of Cold War um, purging of uh, various, both left and right, in Japan. So the, the, the big uh, uh, radical crisis in the late, mid to late 60s, um, what kind of shape did that take in Japan? Okay. It's very different from Europe and the U.S. It's actually very similar oh, yeah? <laughs> to what oh. happened in Europe, and I've, we've done some parallel studies. Oh. But I talk about the long decade of the 60s, because starting in 1958, Japan, Japanese students in particular, became, began mobilizing for opposition to the security treaty, which was going to come up in 1960. So there was a big, massive social movement in 1960, but then the government was able to just um, disregard all opposition and ram the approval of the security treaty through. After that, the students went home and said what went wrong and realized that in 1970, the security treaty would come up again for approval and revision. So they went home and nursed their wounds for a while, but then they began building for the late 1960s. And why so much of the energy among students? It's not something you would recognize today here. No? Actually, it's quite typical that social movements have college students in the forefront. That happens all over the world. Yeah. And that's why sociology departments in particular get yeah. outlawed <laughs> in places where they don't like that kind of activity. But was it more, more active in Japan than yeah. elsewhere? Yeah. Because the other, well, <clears throat> it was happening, and what was happening in the late 1960s was very much driven by um, third world ideas, uh, new left ideas. And by that time, most of the movement had broken with the Japan Communist Party because they were left of it. Um, and so by the late 1960s, first of all, if we can step back a bit, um, part of what happened after the war was they reorganized the public school system into a standard Western style um, elementary and secondary system. So that meant that by the 1960s, they had a whole cohort of young people who had finished high school and therefore were eligible to go to college. So there was a huge expansion of access to college and of desire to go because that was the ticket to the middle class. And so as Japan was ramping up for what became in the 70s and the 80s, its huge success, um, it was fueled by this increase of, of college students in the late 1960s. And there were, by that time, many issues. The security treaty was one of them, but there were environmental issues that were coming to the fore. And there were various kinds of political issues involving um, the presence of US troops and many other things. Um, and by the late 1960s, Japan had a, it was a fully literate society, lots of small scale publishing going on, and there was a big market for left-wing ideas, and particularly these new third world, new left ideas. And Japanese students were getting those things in translation within a year of when they came out uh, in Europe and, and, and the United States. And what was the role States. of Takazawa, your original author, in this setting? Okay. Yes. <clears throat> he was part of that generation yeah. that went to college in the late 1960s, and he became involved in um, a major organization, uh, 
student organization, which then in 1969 split and part of it became the Red Army. The part that was thrown out of the main organization became the Red Army. So he was around the fringes of it. He was involved in getting things published. They were publishing um, newsletters and flyers and all kinds of things, and that was his role. So he knew all the people, but he was in a relatively safe position. Did he have a job margin. as a general? As a red he was a student first, oh, yeah. and then after he he did graduate, unlike many people in that era, but after he graduated, he, because he was known to be affiliated, he could not work for the major corporations, but he was able to find employment as an editor for a small publishing company. And he worked at that company until I think the late 1970s or early 1980s, I think early 1980s, after which he went freelance um, and became a kind of investigative journalist. By then, he already had a reputation for having packaged and published most of the primary materials of the New Left to make them available. Oh, so to the he Japanese was a key. He, yeah. He, he was a key journalist. So, a yeah. Key he was a key edi editor, editor and journalist. Yeah. Editor, okay. Um, just to start getting into the book itself, yes. um, what was his connection to this group? Uh, he was a member. <laughs> um, he was a member of the Red Army faction. Um, he doesn't say that in his publications, no. but that's the I case. Got the, I got the idea. Yes. <laughs> right, yeah. and so he knew all these people, and um, when and he was publishing things for them. So when the group split off, he was working for them and with them, and then in 1970. Uh, when the hijacking to North Korea took place, he was in Japan and then was involved in all of the publishing that was connected oh, we'll, with we'll that. We'll come to the hijacking yes. and that adventure yes. in a moment. Right. Um, uh, what was going on with the Red Army and, and, the, and the group that went into the hijacking? They were saw themselves as part of the Red okay. Army? Yeah. Yes, they thought yeah. themselves as, as the key players in the yeah. Red Army. Yeah. This In early 1960, Nine, um, the government began to crack down on student protest, which was very rides, widespread and had become increasingly violent. So that students already were going to demonstrations to fight with the police, and um, they were beginning to use um, Molotov cocktails and things. And the Red Army, within this major protest organization, began saying, we need to go farther. We need to create an underground army and use weapons and bring about a revolution. So that was their position. And they were led by a philosophy student from um, Kyoto University who was very good at picking up the ethos of what people were thinking and creating catchy phrases to turn it into ideology. And how did they select the first nine? Okay. Um, they, okay, so that group, by the summer of 69, they were thrown out of the main organization for advocating this. So then they became an independent organization. But because they had been part of it and because they had, their people had controlled a lot of the local chapters, they had a lot of people already when they went independent. Okay, and so from that time, they started doing what to them were revolutionary things. Okay. And thereby hangs a tale we'll come to yes. again <laughs> in a moment. Thank you. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness.
Okay, Pat, we have uh, this group that's ready to yes. create World Revolution. Okay. How did they go about it? Well, uh -huh. their first thing in the early fall was they had devised some what would now be called IEDs. They had learned how to take um, these round cans that Peace brand cigarettes came in, fill them full of pachinko balls, um, little round metal balls, uh -huh. and some kind of a detonator, and then they could throw them. Or they also knew how to make simple pipe bombs. Uh -huh. So they started by trying to just um, knock over a police box and get weapons, and of course that failed. Um, but then they had a um, training camp in the mountains where they took over 50 people up for the weekend to learn how to throw these things without blowing themselves up. Um, but they already were way too public because they had been a public organization and a lot of people were known. So the police followed them up there and arrested them all. And that was a major setback. And after that, things were quiet, except that in the process, the police had learned what their plan had been. And their pl what they were doing with this training was to prepare for what, what they hoped would be an attack in which they would surround the prime minister's residence and hold him hostage so he couldn't take a trip to Southeast Asia. <laughs> okay? So uh, when they found that out, all of a sudden, this was not just a little nuisance group, but they were serious folks who were planning dangerous things. Yeah. So the police security and surveillance got extremely heavy, and they really couldn't move for quite some time. In that situation, the ever-inventive Shioni, Shiomi, their leader, came up with a new twist in their theory, which was, we need to pursue the revolution it's getting too difficult to do it in Japan. We need to establish international bases from which we can learn how to do revolution and then come back and make it happen. So the, it was very quiet. Look, people thought nothing was much happening, but they were quietly planning this hijacking. And it happened at the end of March 1970. And the people who were doing it had never been on an airplane before. They didn't know anything about how you do anything other than get a train ticket and jump on the yeah. train. Um, and the first time they tried to do it, um, not everybody showed up in time, so they postponed it. At any rate, on, at the end of March, they were able to hijack a domestic airliner, which was flying to Fukuoka, which is in the south of Japan. Um, and they picked North Korea in part because the plane's range was so limited. That was the only place they could think of where they could get they had to it. refuel to get there. That's right. That's yeah. right. So they, yeah. But at any rate, so they, so they stopped the plane in Fukuoka and were immediately demanding to go to North Korea. At first, the government was delaying and Japan Airlines didn't want to lose its plane. Um, but then, uh, in a very complicated maneuver, um, they took off for what they thought was North Korea. But unbeknownst to them, the South Koreans and the Americans had organized a diversion. And the plane, which they thought was going to North Korea, en route, there was no connection. There was and no way to do it. it. They were using a high school textbook. Map. Yes, right, because they, you know, they didn't know how to do it, and there was no connection to the North Korean um, airline system. So they got diverted to Seoul, and there had been an attempt to make the Seoul airport look like a North Korean airport. So they had all these women in traditional Korean dress come out with their flowers, and. They were, you know, they were hearing that they were in Pyongyang. But then the group in the plane started getting suspicious. And one of them looked out the window and discovered a Northwest Airlines plane on the <laughs> tarmac. And he said, this isn't Pyongyang. This is Seoul. So then they refused to budge. And they were stuck on that tarmac for almost four days, very long period. Um, they had already let off women and ch or old people and children in Fukuoka, but the, uh, there were still a lot of passengers on the plane. So they were bargaining over 
releasing those passengers and getting to North Korea. And eventually, North Korea, all of, by this time, this was international news. It was on the front page of the newspapers everywhere. And people in North Korea saw it, and Kim Il-sung saw an opportunity. So he let, let the Japanese know through the, Re the Korean Red Cross and the Japanese Red Cross that he would accept them and that the plane would be returned. So as soon as that happened, then they said, OK, we'll let you go. Um, and so they let him go to North Korea. So, so we have a, a, a conventional thriller beginning. Right, yes. But now <laughs> comes the fantastic part. Yes. yes. Uh, which is uh, when they landed, the North Korean government didn't really know quite what to do right. with them. And so what did they do? Well, um, they kept asking the hijackers, have you had made contact? And they said, no, we don't know what they're going to do, but we're going to go. So the North Koreans um, treated them very royally, put them up in a fancy hotel, and gave them a big banquet. Then they sent home the plane with the substitute hostage and the crew. And then the hijackers still didn't know what was going to happen. And um, then they were taken, after a few days in the hotel, they were taken to a guest house in the outskirts of Pyongyang, in the countryside. And at first, they didn't know. They thought they might be sent to jail or whatever. But they were then moved to this guest house. And they were asked what they wanted. And they asked for a few things. They basically imagined that they were going to learn how to do revolution. And in the fall, they would go back to Japan and start a revolution there. That in itself was obviously a pipe dream, yeah. although there were lots and lots of young people at that time in Japan who thought the country was on the brink of revolution. Mm -hmm. So they were not total outliers in thinking that the situation was a crisis. Okay? But what's fascinating is that the, Jap uh, the North Korean government bought into this. Yes, yeah. in an amazing yeah. way. Yeah. It turned out that the North yeah. Korean government thought that these little radicals could become the nucleus of a party that would conduct a North Korean-style revolution in Japan. That's an even bigger pipe dream, OK? <laughs> but the two fantasies came together. And they first had to um, brainwash the people through intensive thought control until they gave up their Japanese radical movement and became willing followers of the North Korean Juche ideology. And that happened within the first two years. And that was pretty intensive training that they gave them? Absolutely. But it wasn't just training in ideology. It was right. training in weapons, yes. in spycraft, yes. in uh, what they wanted things. initially yeah. was military training. Yeah, yeah. And they kept saying, well, no, not yet. But So they wouldn't give them any military training until they had already converted and they already saw them as loyal to their ideology and able to. And as far as I can it. tell from the, from the description of the book, it act, they actually succeeded in converting them. Oh, yes, yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. yes. That's a chilling thought. In yes, itself. it is. Yes. Um, and the methods they used um, were described by um, uh, a, an American psychiatrist in terms of China. And they're the methods that had been originally devised and used in China. And so they were used again so in North Korea. So Manchurian candidate style. Yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. And um, Takasawa describes how it was done in the North Korean situation. Um, in a way that made the people feel like they were making their own decisions, um, but they were sliding little by little. Into but then they, they got wives for them, right? Yes. So that was After, quite an operation. Yes. After they had converted, then they wanted to go do things. But they also, by this time, they had a bunch of young guys, and it, they've been there for a decade or more. and their marriageable age. In the mid-1970s, the girlfriend of one of the members, after years of trying to get to North Korea, succeeded. And all of a sudden, there was a woman there. And that caused a lot of unrest among the others. And so the leader of the group felt, well, the only thing we can do is we've got to get wives for them. So his proposal was, why don't you let us go to Europe? There's a lot of Japanese young people there in Europe now. And we'll go find wives. Um, 
and the north koreans said that's an interesting idea we've got a better one and they brought women to north korea and basically match them up and it was kim jong il the son who was the matchmaker who decided who would get which one yeah but but it was quite methodical oh yes oh yes and they all came within a short period of time and they were all married at the same time yes there was a big wedding ceremony yeah, for all of them, which is sort of like the, the Reverend Moon, moon yes, yeah. one. Um, but basically, most of the women were people who had been involved with the North Korean support organizations in Japan. And so they were ready and willing to go to North Korea, and marrying these guys was incidental. They were, they were going because of their interest in North Korea. But they ran out of good candidates. And so the last couple of women were basically deceived into joining, jo into getting to North Korea. And then they all had children. I mean, they averaged yes. two or three children yes, each, right? Yes, they did. Yeah, yeah, so they yeah. remodeled the, their the compound and made it a very palatial place. And they brought in child care people and uh, made a store for them. And they had a fleet of Mercedes Benzes with drivers. And you know, so they were living a very elite life, and they in a, could in a see, real bubble. Yeah, a, yeah, absolutely a bubble. Well, yeah. yeah, but they really had no idea but how different. But then that was. there's a kind of a sad uh, ending, which is they began to get homesick. Well, because they, they knew no other culture but their own and, right. this, and this peculiar one. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. So yeah. yes. But the whole business about homesickness was also used by the North Koreans as a ploy to try to get them back um, to Japan. Uh, and they wrote things and said things about how lonely they were. And of course, the Japanese had no idea they had wives and children. But only after they had wives and children did they then become agents who were then sent to Europe and other places to carry out things for the North Koreans. Oh, wow. So, um, uh, how did they, they, they all left by when? By what date? You know, the, by what date did they leave for Japan? They all went back for Japan. No, right? they no? didn't. Oh, no, no oh, they didn't. Still there? Right. Yes, yeah. there's still uh. four wives and four men and two wives there in North Korea and one child who was a minor earlier. And you're going to go see them. I'm not going to go see them, <laughs> no. but anyway, people but, do. So, uh, just to wrap up, it, it's, it's absolutely fascinating because uh, the impression of a seamless ideology that the North Koreans yes. have is quite impenetrable yes. in the present context. It's, it's just fascinating right. to see it in operation and, yeah. uh, yeah, yeah. and its adventure. No. This book is also very interesting because these, this little group of people lived an elite life. They were right connected directly to the top levers of power. And that, what we see in the press in the United States is the horrible famines yeah. and how awful it is. But these people were in a bubble that was very much like other elites in North Korea. And they have the same kind of mentality as those elites. Yeah. Uh, mentality is the word. Yeah. Well, thanks very much, Pat. Really Thank enjoyed you. it. I loved the book and I look forward Good. to featuring it at the next Hawaii Book and Music Festival. Good, thank you very much for having me, and I look forward to the festival. Great, thank you. Yeah.